Hello everybody, my name is Monsais Franco Sr. and I want to share with you all a little story about me that highlights the views of the world that I inherited. I grew up on the west side of St. Paul, which is home to the earliest of Latinx cultural backgrounds. We currently use the term Latinx because the Spanish language that we inherited is heavy on masculine and female identification, Latino being male, Latina being female. Latinx is us rewriting the rules for inclusion. Where my earliest years were lived out was on Roby Street, and that's one block away from what is now called Cesar Chavez Street, but back then it was called Concord Street. My cultural background, I am a fourth generation, non-Spanish speaking Mexican American. Growing up on the west side, we also had a Cambodian and Hmong community that were Native American families as well as African American families present. I felt like everybody knew everybody. As a kid, I did not see cultural differences. This is my thinking around pre-K kindergarten age. There was a free meal program at a rec center not far from my home called the Neighborhood House. Everyone in my neighborhood that our family interacted with was there. Uh, we all ate together. There was a sense of community. Seeing through my current eyes and staring into the younger eyes of myself, I would say there was a feeling created in, the, in those moments that we were all equal. Still, as a kid, but growing older, there were messages that were sent to me subconsciously that are clearer for me to see now as an adult. When I first noticed cultural differences amongst people, I was in early elementary, let's say first grade or maybe second. I had a classmate named Tim. Tim's hair was combed over to the side and his shirt was tucked in. He looked very different from everyone I knew. I wanted to be like Tim. I thought maybe I wanted to be white because Tim was Caucasian, but not in the way of wanting my skin to change, but I wanted to be the image of what he projected. I seen similar images of Tim, but only on TV and in magazines, commercials, advertisements, and even some cartoons that I watched. As I got older, another message started to reveal itself. The women in my family were frowned upon by the men if they dated a black person. These words were never said, but the mistreatment of women who did date black men was plain to see. This is something I didn't understand because we had black family members, we had black friends, black neighbors, etc. But even if I didn't understand it, it still existed. And that is something that I have to acknowledge. It often came in the form of whispers. She's with that black guy. What did that even mean? Why wasn't he just a guy? Why was it a whisper? These are things that run through my head. Maybe because love is love and it took me to adulthood and gaining a full acceptance of myself to really realize that if anyone has to whisper about something like that, maybe they are not realizing that love is love no matter what form or shape we find it in or who we find it with. Maybe members of your family have or had similar beliefs, maybe you inherited them consciously or subconsciously. We don't have to continue to uphold these ideas anymore. They are hurtful. They are the root to discrimination and inequality. They make us build walls when we could be out there building bridges. Nobody is perfect, but it's okay because that's not the goal. The first time I was called a spick, I was a fourth grader. We were in computer class. I'm dating myself, but let's start thinking about floppy disks, number munchers, and the Oregon Trail, those types of compatible computers. Nate was a classmate, and I remember clear as day. He turned around in his chair, and he faced my direction, and he made eye contact with me. I made eye contact with him. He leaned forward and said, Spick, what do you think I did? Well, I beat him up. I wasn't always this refined gentleman you see today. I'm not promoting violence, but I didn't have the skills to handle the situation any better as a nine-year-old boy. If I could go back, I would educate Nate. I would tell him how hurtful that language and that attitude was towards me, but I didn't have the education or the experience or even the voice to do so then. 
What is significant about that moment is that I did not know what the word spick meant in its totality. All I knew is that what I felt could be summed up to a feeling that I was less than or not equal to. I remember being sent home for my behavior, but I don't remember Nate receiving any consequences for his behavior. When I came home, my mom was mad because I got into a fight. When I told her the word that he used towards me, there was a look in her eyes, and it was as if she had experienced the same thing. It was as if we shared a common experience in that moment. She wasn't happy that I fought, but I could tell that she was glad that I stood up for myself. To be honest with you, I'm not sure that she ever stood up for herself. Now let's take a moment to think of the word Nate used, spick. Now, now, you can't say that word unless you have the ancestors I have. I don't make the rules, it's just how it is. But Nate didn't make that word up. It's been around a long time as a derogatory term for Hispanics. Where do you think Nate heard it from? How, do we, how did he know to use it on me? Most of our lessons, good or bad, begin in the home. We collect them from the people we are surrounded by most both family and friends. Through my experience as an adult, I would become plagued with moments where I did not understand what was happening to me. I would just be stuck with the feeling, that feeling of being less than or not equal to. Throughout life, I've experienced police harassment, guns being drawn on me over minor infractions, not being hired or further developed by employers, when looking for housing, I would bring a white friend or a partner with me to make me a viable candidate because in my experience, I knew this is how things worked. In all of these incidents, there was no one there to stand up for me or anyone to step in and say, hey, that's not okay. And this is what we need more of, people to lift their voices, to use their power and to make a difference. It is my hope that we all, all of us, can change the narrative against marginalized people. In 10th grade, my male Caucasian teacher made it a point to stop me in the hallway and announce, you're back. I thought you would have dropped out already. I mean, stepping in front of me, going out of his way to stop me in my tracks, I believe his name was Mr. Cook. The backstory on that, I had his class the year before, ninth grade. It was our final project, and the project was to build a collage that represented things that were about you. I identified the Mexican flag uh, as the background for my entire collage project. There were other significant things in there that I felt were true to me, that were important to me, and that made me up after all I was following what the assignment was. <sighs> that semester, I would finish with three A's, two B's, and a C minus. I got the C minus from his class. After my final presentation, my grade went from a B plus to a C minus. That year, I would drop out of school. I already felt like I didn't belong based on the history of my collective experiences. It was that feeling of not being equal to feeling less than. I did not have that voice then to advocate for myself. That is common uh, for people of color. We accept and we comply. Sometimes we don't realize what is happening until it's days or years later. It's an inherited way of thinking passed down to us from previous generations. Do not stir the pot becomes the motto, consciously or subconsciously. Racism in any form promotes low self-esteem and creates the sense of, I don't belong here. And I experienced all of that. But that's far from the truth. People that look like me deserve to be in all places where decisions are being made. Our voice, our smile, our input, and our attitude. Representation matters. Representation alone does nothing. We already have to be doing the work to become more culturally competent and inclusive to bring honor to true diversity, equity, and inclusion. Think of the messages sent to you from your upbringing.
Maybe you had parents or grandparents who clearly held negative thoughts towards people who didn't look like them, act like them, or think like them. We can't change that. What we can do is educate ourselves. Even in our differences, we can learn at minimum to respect one another. Change starts with me and you. You could be the bridge. This is bigger than just the family we were raised in. Look at advertisements on TV, radio, magazines, etc. Most of what we see fits the dominant culture. The dominant culture is white and favorable to males. Don't let that discourage you if you fit that profile. We all got work to do. All of us. Just because I am a person of color does not make me more culturally competent. And it does not mean that all of the work that needs to be done is our burden as people of color. I only play one part, and so do you. Everybody is on a different stage in their journey. Some people just don't get it right now, and some people do. Becoming inclusive and culturally competent, we have to adopt the thinking. We don't shame, we educate. Some people are still living in a sense of fear, afraid of people that don't look like them, speak like them, hold their beliefs, etc. But we are all capable of doing better in this area, every single one of us. The systems that were created were created by white males, and that is still the dominant culture today. When this country was founded, there were so many injustices created from the beginning for women and for people of color. You weren't around then, and neither was I, but this is a living thing that we all inherited. Racism exists. Prejudices are still practiced. Stereotypes still eke into our thinking. Remember, if it burdens you or causes you discomfort to talk about racism, imagine how it feels for those of us who have to continue to experience racism firsthand. We all have the opportunity to create a better today and an even better tomorrow. Look around yourself today, in your home and in your world. Do you think we can do better? I do. And we need everybody to make a difference. Search your heart with all of your honesty, for your fears, for your judgments, and the stereotypes that have been ingrained in your thinking. In radical transparency, you will know where your work is that needs to be done to create a more inclusive world for you and for me. Unlearning old messages, relearning new messages, it's all possible if we start. See in color, see in culture. You see my nose, get a side view. It's very Hispanic, it's large, it's shape, it's very me. I want you to see my future, my features that make me me. I want you to see my culture, see what my ancestors left behind. Don't treat me different because of the color of my skin. Do you have friends of other cultural backgrounds? Do you consider yourself diverse? Rethink that. Questions to ask yourself. Do you celebrate other cultures, songs, their dance? Have you tasted their food? Do you know the holidays they celebrate? Or do you just expect everybody to open up gifts on Christmas? Diversity is a continued investment, not just a one-time deposit. The world is bigger than just you and me, and it's okay because there's room for all of us at the table. Creating space for others does not take away your power. It defines your ability to build up, to encourage, and to empower others. The more you learn, share it with others that are close to you. You could be a bridge. And just remember, we can all do better if we try. It's going to take all of us to make our world a better place.